I am so excited that you want to learn about soul injury and the grassroots movement that is bringing it to our attention because this wound is right in our midst. But until now, we haven't had a name for it. And until we have a name for it, we can't identify it or do anything about it. I learned about soul injury in a rather unusual way. I am a hospice nurse practitioner. And during my 30-year career at the VA, I took care of more than 10,000 dying veterans. And those veterans taught me a lesson. They taught me a process for attaining personal peace. And ironically, that lesson about peace came from people who had been trained for war. They showed me a wound deep in their soul, a wound that was different than the PTSD that many of them had. Some of them called it a soul injury. At Opus Peace, we define soul injury as a wound to our sense of self, our real self, beyond the facade. It's a wound that stifles our full potential because it separates us from who we are meant to be. Now, how did these veterans acquire their soul injuries? Well, in a lot of different ways, one of them being the military. I remember one World War II veteran who was dying, and I asked him if there was anything from that war still troubling him now. And then he nodded his head. I asked him if he would want to tell me about it. He nodded his head again. But then he said he was too ashamed to say it out loud. So he motioned for me to come down near him, and this is what he whispered in my ear. He said, do you have any idea how many men I have killed? I said nothing. That is one of those sacred moments you do not want to corrupt with words. Then he said, do you know how many throats I've slit? Again, I said nothing. And we sat in silence, sharing that man's suffering for a long time together. And at length, he asked me, if I would say a prayer for him. So I placed my hand firmly on his chest to anchor his heart. And I prayed something pretty close to this that day. Dear God, this man comes before you acknowledging the pain he has caused others. He has killed. He has maimed. He hurts with the pain of knowing he did this. He hurts with the pain of humanity. He comes before you now asking for forgiveness. He needs your mercy to restore his integrity. He comes before you saying, forgive me for the wrongs I have committed. Dear God, help him feel your saving grace. Restore this man to wholeness so he can come home to you soon. Amen. Now, this man kept his eyes closed throughout that prayer. But when he did open his eyes, this big smile came. It was almost palpable how much lighter he felt. It was such evidence to me of just how heavy shame weighed. Now, this man died the next day. And I contend that he died healed. Sadly, he could have lived healed had someone identified the soul injury that he had been carrying. And if we look at what happened with this man, his peace began when he opened up to the pain and shame he had been running away from for decades, pain and shame that he had buried alive. And it was shame that separated him from his sense of self and his inner goodness. 
and telling his story of shame to a receptive witness allowed him to reown this lost part of himself that he had exiled into darkness. And forgiving himself created a safe place for that part of self to come back home. Now, this man, as he told me his story, was very sad. But like most veterans, he was also very stoic. And that's why he had banished that part of self out into unconsciousness. The problem is, however, for all of us as we come to the end of our life, our conscious mind gets weaker. And it's less able to keep this stuff under wraps. And our unconscious mind becomes stronger. And that's often when these wounds surface unbidden. You see, death beckons us to come back home to ourselves. Death strips us of pretenses and cover-ups. Death humbles us. And often, the unvarnished truth surfaces. I remember a man who used alcohol as his favorite numbing agent. And his addiction had separated him not only from himself, but from his family. But when he received a terminal diagnosis, he sobered up. And he reached out to his family and made amends. And I commented at the courage it had taken for him to do this. And he looked at me and he said, Why did I have to be dying in order to learn how to do this? And indeed, that is the gift that death is. Death wakes us up to how our lives matter. Suddenly, we realize what is important and what is not. So many of the soul injuries that I witnessed at the end of life would fall under what the professional literature calls moral injury. And moral injury is a subcategory of the larger classification of soul injury. And this broader classification includes marginalized populations. Populations who have often been made to feel less than because of their race or their religion or their gender or their sexual orientation. It includes childhood wounds that often persist a lifetime if someone has been bullied or made to feel like they were not good enough. And I have yet to meet an adult who as a child was in the foster care system who hasn't suffered a soul injury. And yet, decades later, the wound is laid bare. And I could easily see how that wound had caused them to lose their identity, to forget who they really were, and to erect a facade to try to be someone they were not. Can you identify with that? Even in a small way? I can. This is a picture of me when I was five. I'm watching Lassie on TV, and she's in some dangerous situation, and I'm sure she's going to die, and I'm crying. And just then, my dad walked through the room, and he laughed at my tears. And I made a five-year-old decision that day to never cry again. And I didn't for 30 years. But when I was 35, and I was dealing with something painful, it occurred to me, what if my fear of feeling my pain is worse than if I just let myself feel it? And that's when my unfreezing began. That's when I started becoming real. Now, I hesitate to even tell you that story. It seems so trivial compared to the traumatic stories I've witnessed with veterans. But I can tell you there are lots of ways to lose yourself. And you could lose yourself suddenly after trauma or gradually, insidiously corroding your sense of self. Either way, you will arrive at the same lifeless, soulless place. 
And when I ask people to describe that place, they will often use words such as they feel empty, are alone, are ashamed, are worthless, are defective. They say they might think that their life has no meaning or that a part of themselves is missing or that there is a hole in their soul. And what do they yearn for? They yearn to have that hole filled with their authentic self, filled with a life that has meaning. And they yearn for the, uh, for the facade to come down. Yet they fear that if it does, they'll be abandoned or rejected yet again. Do you see the dilemma? So what can we do? Well, first of all, we have to stop being afraid of emotional pain. Because when you box up your pain, your personhood, your vitality, your passion gets boxed up as well. And that is a recipe for acquiring a soul injury. But when we can learn how to live our life passionately, we stop numbing our pain and instead let ourselves feel it. We tell our ego to stop covering our pain up with anger, fear, and shame. We talk to that part of ourself. We comfort that part of ourself, and not with numbing agents either. Secondly, we need to learn how to mourn losses and to forgive hurts caused by us and hurts caused to us. Otherwise, we will stay stuck in the past. Grieving and forgiving free us to enter fresh into the present moment without unmourned loss and unforgiven guilt and shame weighing us down. And lastly, we need to recognize that hate, despair, and hostility are actually the acting out of unmourned loss and hurt. Because hurting people often hurt other people. And until we recognize that, we will continue to look in the wrong places to heal the violence in our world. I came here today to share lessons about how to reown, rehome, and revitalize scattered pieces of self so we can be restored to wholeness. I didn't learn these lessons in graduate school. I learned these lessons from dying veterans. I didn't learn these lessons easily either. Indeed, I became a VA nurse because I arrogantly thought I needed to save veterans from the so-called dysfunctional behaviors that I learned about when I was a nursing student rotating through the VA. But truth be told, those veterans saved me. Without them, I would have remained an isolated elitist striving for comfort and security. They rescued me from the anemic life I could have led. A few years ago, I retired from the VA to start Opus Peace. I wrote those 10,000 veterans a letter to thank them for the lessons they had taught me. I am going to close by reading you the last paragraph of that letter. When you were dying, you vets taught me that we already have everything we need in order to be whole. Unlike what I thought, it's not about being stronger or bigger or more resilient. It's about removing barriers of loss and shame that prevent access to the soul of who we are. You vets taught me how the soul speaks a different language. Some of you wrote or painted or sang about your soul injuries. Many of you had colorful language to describe your soul injuries. But most of you 
simply used your wartime experience to quietly seek peace in your own way and to bring peace to those around you. For some of you, peace remained elusive, so you remained hostile or bitter or addicted. Some of you were even dying because of the consequences of those behaviors. Yet as death approached, most of you yielded to the secrets your soul revealed. As you did, I listened and learned truths that can only be taught by the dying. And what your regrets revealed was this. Stop the denying. Stop the numbing. Reconnect with the part of self holding your pain and shame. Don't waste your suffering. Learn from it. Use it as the passport into your deepest self and you will discover the power of your soul. Now that you know what 10,000 veterans would want you to know about soul injury, I wonder if we could recite the hope and vision that Opus Peace has for each of us, and if we could do this together. Cultivate in me the willingness to reown, rehome, and revitalize scattered pieces of self so wholeness can be restored. Grow in me the honesty, courage, and humility to release my fear of who I am and who I am not. Fuel me with your grace. Thank you.